Welcome, everybody. I'm glad to see a good crowd here. Um, uh, this is a, a special evening for us, a special event to commemorate Black History Month. Uh, so I'm very glad you've joined us this evening. I'm Bob Hauser. I'm the executive officer of the American Philosophical Society held at Philadelphia for promoting useful knowledge. I love to say the full name. It sounds so cool. Um, the American Philosophical Society acknowledges with respect that it resides in Lenape Hoking, the homeland of the Lenape people, whose historical relationships with this land occur and uh, continue to this day. We recognize their continued presence and perseverance to, despite centuries of land theft, removal, and persecution of their language and cultural traditions. Throughout its history, the society has benefited from its residents in this part of Lenape land, now called Philadelphia. We honor the Lenape community and those of other native peoples through our collections, fellowships, research, awards, and engagement activities. As you may know, one of the three main areas of our collection uh, in the library is Native American language and culture. Uh, and uh, we hold something like materials from something like 650 Native communities. And, uh, and there may be more. Uh, and uh, we're presently in touch with a, and active, uh, in, actively in touch with about 60 uh, such communities. And of course, our holdings are held with, what should I say, with appropriate respect to those communities so that we do not release to the public anything that they consider to be uh, culturally sensitive. We follow their guidelines with respect to the uh, public release of our materials, although in general in the library, you know, everything is there for the taking. Um, and we have a research center now, very nicely endowed, uh, Center for Native American and Indigenous, and Indigenous Research, which, um, which has uh, a, a reasonable endowment and, uh, and funding for about close to a dozen Indigenous fellows, Native American fellows, every year from the Mellon Foundation. Anyway, for those joining us for the first time, the American Philosophical Society was founded by Benjamin Franklin in 1743 with the mission of promoting useful knowledge. Most of our founders were members, and the APS had Thomas Jefferson as its president for 17 years, during most of which time he was uh, Secretary of State, Vice President, or President of the United States. Like the Constitution, the Presidency, the Congress, the courts, as a source of and keeper of knowledge, the society was an essential piece of the bedrock on which our new nation was founded almost 250 years ago, and I'd like to think that it remains so today. In the 21st century, we sustain Franklin's mission in three principal ways. We honor and engage leading scientists and scholars and professionals through elected membership and opportunities for interdisciplinary intellectual fellowship. We support research and discovery through grants and fellowships, lectures, publications, prizes, exhibitions, and public education. We serve scholars through a research library of manuscripts and other collections that are recognized internationally for their enduring historic value. On the occasion of Black History Month, I think it's especially important to recall, recognize, and reject less salutary parts of the APS history. While we at the Society continue to honor Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and other founding members for their key roles in the formation of our nation, for their leadership of, of the Society, and for their devotion to science, education, and other noble causes. We're also much aware of their faults. Most significantly, their slaveholding, 
and their racist beliefs. Also, during the 19th century, members of the society were creators of so-called scientific racism. And in the first half of the century, APS members were leaders in the eugenics movement. Today, we at the APS totally reject these immoral practices and unscientific doctrines. We're committed to sustaining the better parts of our founders' legacies while working toward a future of inclusion, diversity, equity, and access. That's the APS idea. In this evening's lecture, Andrew Deemer will share the story based on his wonderful new book of the life of William Still. William Still escaped from slavery and established a new and highly successful life here in Philadelphia. He became a key figure in the Underground Railroad. In fact, I think it's fair to say that he coined that term, and his pretty close. Uh, if I, when I lie, he'll, 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 you know, he'll correct me. Uh, um, I'm, I'm accustomed to this, and I'm not too proud. Um, and, um, but his book, called The Underground Railroad, is right over there. And so if you haven't, it was uh, loaned to us by, uh, by uh, the Carpenters Company. For some reason, we don't have a copy, or at least not, an, not a first edition. But it's, it's from 1872. It's right over there. So if you haven't visited it yet, uh, uh, take, time, take the time to, uh, to visit it uh, later on. Um, and uh, we know of Still's signal accomplishments in part because at great risk he kept a complete secret diary of his activities. Tonight's talk is not the only recent celebration by the APS of William Still's remarkable life. The APS meeting of April 2021 featured excerpts from APS member Paul Moravec's oratorio, Sanctuary Road, which is also based on Still's diary. Um, I want to point out uh, for later that we do have several copies of Vigilance at the back of the room that will be available for sale. And we have two other publications there that some of you might be interested in, uh, one of which is uh, a little reprint from uh, the proceedings of the society about a visit that Franz Boas, the great anthropologist, paid to um, W.E.B. Du Bois in, uh, uh, more than 100 years ago. And, um, and then uh, we also have a book that the APS Press just published, uh, quite a hefty volume, um, which is a catalog to more than 400 slave stories with excerpts, various excerpts from them. It's a huge, but it's a huge catalog, a ter terrific and a really quite relevant uh, scholarly resource uh, that, uh, that the society is very pleased uh, to have published. With that, I'm going to welcome this evening's speaker, Andrew Deemer. He's Associate Professor of History at Towson University, here, and he earned his degree here from Temple University. In addition to the life of William Still, Professor Deemer is the author of The Politics of Black Citizenship, Free African Americans in the Mid-Atlantic Borderland from 1817 to 1863, which was published by the University of Georgia Press in 2016. Professor Deemer. Thank you so much for that introduction, and thank you to the Philosophical Society for inviting me here, and, and thank you to all of you for being here. Um, it's wonderful and an honor to be here and uh, to have a chance to talk about William Still. So when you write a book, when it comes time to go out and to try to convince people to read this book, to buy it, yeah. the press urges a certain kind of language on you. They like you to talk about your book in a certain kind of way. They love formulations like the hidden history of this, 
the untold story of that. Never before whatever. I suppose that they believe that this is going to get people to buy your book. And I suppose they know more about selling books than I do. The problem is, it's almost never true. There really aren't a ton of never before told stories out there. This is not one of them. People have been telling William Still's story since he was telling his own story. He was a historian, as you heard, of the Underground Railroad.、Um, the question is have we been paying attention? Now, if you go into a bookstore, you are going to see in the biography section a lot of familiar faces. In fact, some of those familiar faces are hiding behind the screen right now. <laughs> We see lots of books written about the same people over and over again. And I, I certainly wouldn't walk in here, of all places, and tell you that you shouldn't learn about Benjamin Franklin.、Um, but the case I want to make to you tonight is that William Still also. Deserves our attention, that his life is important.、Um, and that's what I want to spend some time doing tonight is to, to suggest to you that William still belongs in that same conversation. So, to do this, I'm going to begin more or less where the book begins. So, if you will, I ask you to imagine yourself on an August evening in 1850, William still. Seen here in the earliest photograph we have of him, is seated at his desk at the Pennsylvania Anti Slavery Society office, just a few blocks from here on North Fifth Street. The door opens. In walk two men. One of these men still knows. He's seen him before. The other's a complete stranger. And the stranger introduces himself as Peter Friedman. And Peter Friedman begins to tell the story of what had brought him here to Philadelphia. He'd been separated from his parents as a young boy, sold to a master in Kentucky, then to Alabama. After years of struggle and saving, and after the death of his elder brother, Peter was finally able to purchase his freedom. Upon doing so, he decided to head north. To look for that family that he had been torn away from all those years before. Now, the problem was, he didn't really know very much about this family. He didn't have much to go on. He remembered that they had lived in a home near the Delaware River, and so he headed for Philadelphia. And, and this brings him to William Still's door. Now, Still listened to all of this with some skepticism. Not skeptical about the story's truth. So he had heard stories like this before, they were not uncommon. But he was unfortunately skeptical that he was going to be able to help this man. Nevertheless, he asked him to, to tell him whatever information he could remember about his family. And so Peter began. My mother was named Sydney, he said. My father was named Levin. All of a sudden, The mood in the room changed. Still couldn't believe what he was hearing. His own parents had been named Sidney and Levin. His older brothers had been separated from those parents at about the same age that Friedman was describing. It began to dawn on William Still that this man sitting across from him, a man he had never seen before, was in fact his brother. Now, This is surely among the most amazing, meaningful, moving stories in a life filled with such moments. It was a moment that still would come back to over and over again in telling the story of his life. It's a moment, though, that can also tell us some really important things about William Still. And I think it, begins us, it gives us a, a nice starting point to think about his life. It was no accident that Peter Still walked into William Still's office. It was no miracle, as miraculous as it might seem. It was instead the result of the work that William Still had already begun. He had placed himself at the center 
of a vast network of abolitionists, a network stretching from Georgia all the way to as far as Canada, a network that was already being called in Still's day the Underground Railroad. It was Still's place at the center of this vast network that helps explain why Peter had come to him that day. The moment also suggests for us another important aspect of Still's life, and that is the connection between family and Still's work. Still was raised in an abolitionist family. After all, both his parents had been enslaved. His mother, seen here, was in fact a fugitive from slavery. Like so many families, the Still family had been torn apart by slavery. And so they show us um, something really typical for this, uh, in this sense, that black families and black communities were the foundation of the Underground Railroad. Um, now, by the early 1850s, Still's sort of informal familial involvement in the aid to fugitive slaves had moved on to something else, had become more formal, and he had become the chair of the Philadelphia Vigilance Committee, technically the acting committee of the Vigilance Committee. This was an organization dedicated to protecting and aiding fugitive slaves by any and all means necessary. This position involved still in some of the biggest, most dramatic, most memorable events of his era. And I want to spend a little time going through three of these events because I think they each illustrate important aspects of Still's work. The first of these important moments and exciting moments in Still's life involves a man named Henry Brown. Some of you may have heard of Henry Brown. Brown was enslaved in Richmond, Virginia, where his master hired him out to work in a tobacco factory. This is fairly typical of urban slavery of this period, the late 1840s. Also typical of urban slavery in this period, Brown was married to a woman, but that woman and their children were owned by a different master. And so, in August 1848, that other master decided to, to sell Brown's wife and their children. He would later recall the horror of coming home and seeing his wife and children in chains marched down the street of Richmond. It was at this moment that Henry Brown decided to run away. For many enslaved people, family was the thing holding them back. The fear of losing family members, of never seeing them again, was what led them to remain in bondage. Without that holding him back, Henry Brown decided to take his chances and run away. Deciding to run away, though, and actually succeeding in doing so, were two different things. Fortunately for Henry Brown, he concocted an ingenious plan. Along with an associate, Brown had himself sealed in a crate and mailed from Richmond to Philadelphia. Now, this outrageous plan would have been inconceivable and more or less impossible just a few years earlier when this trip would have taken probably days. But transportation improvements had led for this trip to take only about 24 hours in 1848. But it would be a dangerous and excruciating 24 hours. At one point, the crate was turned over and Brown had to spend some of this trip suspended uncomfortably on his shoulder. When the crate arrived in Philadelphia, an associate of Stills met it at the depot and brought it to the Anti-Slavery Society office, where Still and a few other men gathered around the crate, desperately hoping that Henry Brown had, to, had survived this dangerous trip. They knocked on the crate, and when they heard a response, they pried off the top of the box, and Henry Brown emerged from the crate, forever after known as Henry Box Brown. So you can see still here in the back, uh, directly behind Henry Brown. So Henry Brown would spend a few days in Philadelphia, recuperating some of it in the still home, before being sent on north via Still's Underground Railroad Network to safety, where he would go on to fame as an abolitionist. So in this moment, we see some of the hallmarks of Still's activism. He is not the one traveling into the South, right? He is relying upon the, 
the uh, ingenuity and the fearless action of Henry Brown himself, and yet still is a critical element of all of this. Without Still's coordination, without his presence here, without this network that he's helping build, the chances of Henry Brown succeeding in this endeavor are extremely limited. So I want to turn to a, a second exciting event of Still's life. Um, this one just a couple years later, and, in, and involving quite a different set of circumstances. In September 1851, Still received word that there were slave catchers in Philadelphia. Now, this was particularly important in 1851 because the year before, Congress had passed a new fugitive slave law. This law, in turn, was a response to laws that had been passed across the North, the so-called personal liberty laws, which had put up barriers to the, the catching of slaves and made it increasingly difficult for slave catchers to come into northern states and pursue fugitive slaves. The fugitive slave law would essentially enlist the power of the federal government to do this work with slave catchers. And so under the authority of this fugitive slave law, a man named Edward Gorsuch, a Maryland slave owner, had come to Philadelphia seeking a warrant for four men, John Beard, Thomas Wilson, Alexander Scott, and Edward Thompson. These men had fled Gorsuch's farm, and he had learned that they were now living as free men in Christiana, about 50 miles west of Philadelphia. Once Still received this information, he quickly passed word along his Underground Railroad network to uh, an existing vigilance committee in Christiana. So there was a, an existing and robust vigilance committee in Christiana made up mostly of fugitive slaves who were ready at a moment's notice to protect one of their own against slave catchers. With the advance notice from Still, this vigilance committee was prepared and they successfully fought off Gorsuch and his posse. The fugitives in question were able to escape and eventually make it to Canada. So we see here, yet again, Still's work having consequences. We see the importance of intelligence gathering. We see that the Underground Railroad is not just a route upon which, underground, or, uh, or upon which fugitive slaves travel, it's also a route upon which information travels. Which brings us to our last moment. This one takes place in 1855, so a couple years later. Still was once again sitting at his desk in his office. This time the door opened and in walked a boy who placed a note on his desk. The note read the following. Sir, Will you come down to Bloodgood's Hotel as soon as possible? There are three fugitive slaves here and they want their liberty. Their master is with them on his way to New York. Now still knew this hotel. Bloodgood's was near the Walnut Street Pier and he knew that if this master was indeed on his way to New York, he would likely take the ferry from the Walnut Street Pier, catch a train on the New Jersey side and take that to New York he realized that his best chance to help this woman was to catch them before they crossed the Delaware River. And so he hurried to Bloodgood's Hotel. Before he got there, though, he made one stop. He stopped in and enlisted an ally of his, a man named Passmore Williamson. Now, Williamson was a white man. Williamson was the, the one white member of the acting committee of the Vigilance Committee. Still realized that in this sort of moment, it would be useful to have a white man along with him, a man who could do certain things that he couldn't. They arrived at the hotel and were told that the woman in question was no longer there. She had already gone to the ferry, and so they hurried to the ferry and made their way to the top deck where they found her with her children, and standing behind them, a man that's still described as a sickly-looking white man they took to be their master. Still and Williamson approached the woman who they later learned was named Jane Johnson, and they informed her that she was legally free. Now, 
Pennsylvania, as many of you know, had begun the process of gradually abolishing slavery decades earlier. But when they initially passed this legislation, they included a provision which allowed uh, masters to bring slaves into Pennsylvania as long as they didn't overstay a period of six months. By this point, however, that provision had been, uh, had been uh, repealed. And so by bringing this woman into Pennsylvania, she had legally become free. Um, to contrast this with fugitive slaves, right? If they had taken themselves, they would not be free. But since her master brought her willingly into Pennsylvania, she was now legally free. But still, and Williamson pointed out to Jane that being legally free did not make one free in reality. That if she wanted to be free in reality, she needed to take this opportunity. She needed to seize this moment because it might not come again. Jane began walking towards them, bringing her sons with her, at which point the man behind her, her master, uh, reached out and tried to keep her from going with still. Now, Fortunately, at this exact moment, a group of black men who had gathered on the scene, curious about what was going on, closed in around the master and restrained him, allowing Jane to escape with William Still down the steps of the ferry into a waiting carriage where Still drove her off into the Philadelphia streets. Um, she would stay overnight with the Stills, and then he would send her along to safety, again, using this underground railroad network. Now, it turns out this master in question was an important man. His name was John Wheeler, and he was, in fact, the U.S. minister to Nicaragua. He was actually on his way to his post in Nicaragua at this moment. Now, this post as U.S. minister to Nicaragua was an important post at this moment in our history. So, in the 1850s, slaveholding politicians were sort of greedily eyeing the, the Caribbean and, and Central America. Um, in some cases, they hoped to annex this territory to the United States. At the very least, they wanted to make sure that these newly independent nations were friendly to slavery, that they were not a threat to slavery. Um, and so his post was a, a way to make sure this happened. And in fact, he had dined with the president the night before at the White House. So that suggests some of his importance in, uh, in national politics. As you can imagine, a man like this was not about to give up without a fight. Higgy probably realized that his chances of recovering Jane and her sons were not too great, but at the very least, he wanted to make the men responsible for her freedom pay. Um, using these connections, he, uh, he ensured that all the men involved, still included, were prosecuted. They were ultimately accused of assault and battery. The case that Wheeler was making was that Jane Johnson never would have willingly chosen to run away, that she had somehow been coerced by these men and that they had forcibly prevented him from rescuing her from being coerced. Uh, not too plausible, but this was the argument he made in court. Um, ultimately, the, the case didn't work. Ultimately, all of these men were acquitted, and most importantly, Jane Johnson and her sons were never returned to bondage. So here again, we see the importance of intelligence gathering to Still's operation. We see Still and Williamson cannily, cleverly navigating the border between federal and state law. And most importantly, we see the importance of the black community of Philadelphia. Without the intervention of these men who just happened to be there on the ferry that day, it is unlikely, or at least it is, is possible, that this rescue would not have succeeded. So, um, these are exciting moments, right? These are dramatic moments, and, and uh, I think as I've suggested, they tell us something important about Still's life, but it's also true that exciting moments can't ever tell the story, the whole story of someone's life. Think about your life. Yes, important things happen, and these dramatic moments are important, and yet there's also the day-to-day -day stuff, right? And you can't really understand someone's life without thinking a little bit about what those day-to-day -day things were. And so I want to pivot a little bit to thinking not about these big, exciting moments in Still's life, but instead about the mundane details. 
the stuff that doesn't seem that exciting, but which, I'm going to make the case, were absolutely vital to the success of Still's operation and to ultimately his ability to aid perhaps a thousand, certainly hundreds of fugitive slaves on their way to freedom. Still was, in essence, a connector. His work, more than anything else, involved connecting people, people who were willing to do some part in this larger struggle to aid fugitive slaves, but people who on their own wouldn't have been nearly as successful as they were when brought together with other like-minded people. He had connections near in places like Wilmington, Delaware, where his close confidant Thomas Garrett worked uh, to shuttle or to, to funnel fugitive slaves towards still in Philadelphia. He had similar allies in uh, Elijah Pennypacker in Chester, um, William Whipper and Stephen Smith in Lancaster, Joseph Bustle in Harrisburg. These are just a few of the, the men who participated in this network, who transported men on their way to Philadelphia to meet still. Uh, often doing so via train, right? Above ground trains. We have an in instances over and over again where this underground network is actually unfolding on above ground trains. Um, however, it was important that if someone was coming to Philadelphia via a train, that someone be there to meet them when they arrived. Perhaps the most dangerous place for a fugitive slave to be would be milling around a train station looking where to go next. That is exactly where slave catchers would be looking for them. Um, and so still had to communicate with these men who were sending fugitive slaves his way. Sometimes he does so by telegraph. So still is a, an innovator in using the new technology of the day to make his work successful. Still also had connections in southern ports. So he had long-standing relationships with ship captains who sailed in and out of southern ports, places like Wilmington, North Carolina, Norfolk, Virginia. Some of these captains were willing, some of them for money, but some of them were willing to smuggle fugitive slaves out of these places. This practice of smuggling fugitive slaves out of southern ports was so common that North Carolina actually instituted a policy known as smoking. Um, how this worked was essentially a ship before sailing out of a port had to be infused with noxious smoke that was supposedly going to drive any fugitive slave hiding somewhere out into the open. Others attempted to reproduce Henry Box Brown's method. Some of them successfully, some of them not successfully. But clearly, their success was in part dependent upon coordination with William Still. Others simply arrived. They arrived in Philadelphia and were brought to Still via allies, people who knew that he was the one who could help them. Sometimes they just show up at his home or at his office. Uh, sometimes they would stay with Still. Sometimes he would find other place for this, places for them to stay. Sometimes he provided them with medical care, with food. Sometimes he provided them with things as seemingly simple as a bath and a haircut. We must remember that many of these men and women and children had been on the road for weeks, maybe months. If they, needed, if they were going to blend in and, and to take the next step, they were often going on trains to New York. They needed to blend in. They needed to not stand out. In other words, they needed to not look like fugitive slaves. And so paying for someone, for a man to be shaved, was absolutely essential for that person's success. Still also provided pocket change, train tickets, connections in New York City and beyond. Again, just as fugitive slaves were not safe on the streets of Philadelphia, they were no safer on the streets of New York. In fact, by some measures, they might have been less safe in New York. And so if they were going to be transported, sent on the train to New York, still needed to send word ahead. He needed to make sure one of his allies was there to meet him or her when they got there. All of this, of course, cost money. None of this was free. And a big part of Still's work was raising the money that made the Underground Railroad work, 
Again, some of this came from nearby sources, some from faraway sources. Um, much of the, the money for, for the village Vigilance Committee in Philadelphia came from meetings that were held, public meetings, I might note, um, public meetings that were held to raise money for the Vigilance Committee, often in black churches. So black churches were, uh, in many ways, the uh, foundation of this underground railroad work that still was doing. Much of this money came also from as far away as Great Britain. So British abolitionists were great supporters of the cause of the Vigilance Committee. It also fell to still, and I've, I've hit a little bit, I've touched a little bit on this, uh, to gather information, the information that would make this organization work. I've talked a little bit about some of the, the sort of specific moments, but information gathering was a day-to-day -day responsibility for still. Southern newspapers were delivered to the anti-slavery office every day and still looked through these newspapers looking particularly for those runaway slave ads that tended to be run in southern newspapers. Now, of course, masters had placed these ads in hopes that they would recover their property. Here still is turning this cause on its head, right? Still is reading them as a way to anticipate who might be coming his way as a way to be sure that he's ready to help them. Often these, under, these uh, runaway slave ads uh, included information that so-and-so was likely headed this way, right? This was important information for Still to know. He also had informants. So we've talked a little bit about some of the kind of informal informants that he had, people who just heard something, people who uh, received information and knew Still would be able to use it. He also had police officers who were sympathetic to the cause. So police officers were often enlisted in attempts to recover fugitive slaves, but not all of them were sympathetic to the recovery of fugitive slaves. Some of them passed that information along to Still so he would know to look out for particular danger. As you can imagine, um, with all of this work, um, this was not a nine to five job, right? This Underground Railroad work dominated Still's professional life, and it spilled over into his, per his personal life. Recall, as I said earlier, that he had come from an abolitionist family. He came from a family where aiding fugitive slaves was something that was expected of you. This continued in his own family. So um, while sometimes he would find other places for fugitive slaves to stay, quite often, those fugitives stayed in the Still household. Which meant, of course, that Letitia Still, William's wife, was also a vital part of this work. Now, as is often the case when we look at women in history, it is sometimes difficult to know exactly what that work was. But one of the best indications of just how important Letitia Still's work was to this larger cause was that we see in letters written to William Still from refugees who had settled in Canada and are writing to Still years later, over and over again, constantly, they mention Letitia Still. They want to be remembered to her. They talk about how wonderful their time was with her. They remember the Still children who were quite young at this point. We should remember that for many of these fugitives from slavery, Running away meant running away from one's own family, leaving one's own family behind. And so we could imagine just how touching and meaningful it was, even for just a, a night, to stay in the still household, to be surrounded by this wonderful domesticity. Um, and this is reflected in these letters, the importance of this domestic shelter that they found in the still home. Still's Underground Railroad work also led him to take on a more public role in the broader abolitionist movement. Now, of course, much of his work on the Underground Railroad was by necessity secretive, but counter to what we assume, Still was actually publicly known as the leader of the Vigilance Committee and the leader of the Underground Railroad. Um, it was no secret that he was the guy in Philadelphia who was helping fugitive slaves. Uh, and this public role as the leader of the Underground Railroad led him to take on, you know, other roles within the abolitionist movement. So, for example, we see Still standing up as a part of a protest against the Fugitive Slave Law in 1850. 
We see him penning letters to the newspaper, weighing in on the, the events of the day. So we have letters from William Still talking about the rise of the anti-slavery Republican Party, for example. We see a letter from Still denouncing the hated Dred Scott decision after it was issued by the Supreme Court. Still also became a very public advocate for black citizenship rights. Um, now, abolitionists like Still didn't just fight for the end of slavery. They also fought for people to become full citizens of the United States. For Still, one of his most notable crusades in this regard was his push for the desegregation of streetcars in Philadelphia. Now, in Philadelphia, you know, Philadelphia was founded as a, a city where pretty much you could walk wherever you wanted to go. But as the city grew beyond its original boundaries, um, it became important to have some other means of transportation. And by the late 1850s, that was the streetcar. So streetcars were carriages that were pulled by horses but ran along rails. Since they ran along rails, they were a little bit faster, a little bit more comfortable, and a little bit cheaper, which meant that in contrast to some earlier forms of transportation, they were at least theoretically open to black Philadelphians. However, while black Philadelphians could ride these streetcars, they couldn't ride inside. They had to ride on a platform on the outside, which, as you can imagine, in bad weather was quite unpleasant, also quite dangerous. People frequently fell off the platform, and so uh, for, for obvious reasons still found this unacceptable, and he began in the late 1850s a very public crusade to change this, which was ultimately successful in 1867. He was also an advocate for black voting rights, which had been lost to black Pennsylvanians in 1838. More broadly, he was a, an advocate for black economic progress as well, what, what in the day they would have called black uplift. Um, he saw himself as a particular model of black uplift. Eventually, he would become one of the wealthiest black men in Philadelphia. Along with this, he supported black education. So he's sort of uh, hitting on all sorts of reforms that he believes are promoting the cause of black uplift. Despite all of this involvement, all of these different activisms, at the core of Still's work was always the Underground Railroad. And he never lost sight of the importance of that work in his life, even after that work was done. Now, as I mentioned, while Still was doing this work, he was recognized as the leader of the Underground Railroad in Philadelphia, and he was also publishing accounts of this work which once again runs counter to what we think we know about the Underground Railroad, right? We might ask ourselves, why would he be doing this? This seems like a, a, an unnecessarily risky thing to do, to be talking about the very thing that you're doing, which is obviously illegal. So I think there are a couple reasons why still, even in the midst of this Underground Railroad work, was publicizing it selectively, keeping in mind that he's never going to give away too many details. The first thing is that still had to raise money. How do you get people to donate to a cause if they don't know what's happening? Um, telling these very carefully selected stories of the Underground Railroad was a way of making sure people knew this was going on and that they should donate to this cause. The second reason I think that he publicized his work in the 1850s was that the 1850s were dark days for abolitionists. Um, things were not going their way. The slave power, which is how they talked about the political power of slavery, was often the victor in the 1850s. Telling these stories of the Underground Railroad was a way of buoying the confidence of abolitionists, reassuring them that while things weren't always going their way, it was possible to succeed. It was possible to make a difference. Um, now, after the Civil War, after the risk of telling these stories had been alleviated, he was increasingly called upon to tell these stories publicly. He became a kind of official storyteller of the Underground Railroad. Still, of course, wanted to get this history right. Already, 
by the 1860s. There were those who were telling the history, the stories of the Underground Railroad in a way that emphasized what we might call white benevolence and heroism. In this telling, fugitive slaves themselves were sort of helpless beneficiaries of this white benevolence. Now, it's important to note, Still never slighted the contributions of his white allies. Many of his closest confidants were, in fact, white. And so this was important to Still, and yet he knew this was not the whole story. He wanted to tell a fuller, truer story of the Underground Railroad. And in particular, he wanted to um, challenge this notion that fugitive slaves were the helpless beneficiaries of others' benevolence. Instead, still insisted that they were key contributors to their own liberation. To borrow the language of the Underground Railroad, they were agents in their own flight to freedom. The ultimate fruits of this storytelling would be, we have it on display right over here, you can come up and take a look at it, Still's magnum opus, the Underground Railroad. Nearly 800 pages detailing the remarkable collective struggle that still had been such an important part of. A shorter book might have been the story of an exceptional few, but instead still gives us the story of hundreds of remarkable individuals who, despite the considerable barriers placed before them, flew to freedom. For still, this was fundamentally a demonstration of the capacity and ability of black men and women, their intelligence, their ingenuity, their persistence. It was, in other words, a part of his activism. There was no clear line for Still between writing about the struggle of the Underground Railroad and participating in the broader movement to promote black rights. This book, therefore, was a fitting encapsulation of Still's life. Still's life, his story, both the book and his life, were not then the story of a single lone individual. Instead, this story is the story of how one remarkable man contributed to a broader collective struggle. Still always knew, and he always maintained, that this struggle was larger than himself. Thank you. I, I, I'm happy to take any questions if right. you have. I trust that we have some time for a few questions. And we have a mic which will be passed around to those who are lucky enough to be called upon. Let's start with Carrie Bryan here. There are so many, is this on? There are so many things I could address just today as a history hunters program for historical Germantown. I was teaching about 50 children of color at the Johnson House <clears throat> about the Underground Railroad and William Stills. So William Stills' messages are going on. There are all sorts of little points I could ask, like I have read your book and looked at the list, and why isn't Henry Box Brown listed? Listed. In your list of those persons? I'm not sure which list you're referring to. OK. But then moving on, then, then there's the issue of William Stills and then Octavius V. Caddo coming mm. on in the, the uh, okay. integration of, of sure. public transit. So just bringing sure. up some yeah, little, I can talk little a little niggly about, points. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I, sort of, I, I sort of centered the Underground Railroad work, but, but I alluded to this later work that still was involved in the desegregation of the streetcars. And um, for a, a time, he and Octavius Caddo, who's a little bit younger than Still, work together. But then at the end of this, they're, they're successful, and there's a, there's a, a break between the two. Um, and it's, it's pretty acrimonious. You know, it's pretty nasty, and, and Still would hold a grudge against Caddo for a long time, for the rest of Caddo's short life. Um, I, you know, I talk a lot about this in the book, so I, I won't go too far into this, but I will say that there are both personal and professional tensions between them. So um, personally, you know, I talk in the book a little bit about how uh, 
Caddo seemingly has fathered a child with this woman who worked in the Still household. And, and for a man like Still, who's very uh, morally upright, this is, this is a pretty awful thing. Um, they have some differences over how to go about doing this, this work. Um, I think ultimately Still also, Still's kind of a self-made man, right? He's, he's self-educated, and he sees this younger generation of Philadelphians, including Caddo, who have been given lots of opportunities he didn't have, well-educated. They come from at least middle-class black families, and they're coming in and sort of telling him his business. I think that's a source of resentment as well. So there, there are multiple factors going on here. The, um, uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Here, first. The, your book calls him father of the Underground Railroad, and not ever having heard of him, actually, before today, or before I saw your talk advertised, um, I wondered if that meant that he'd created the Underground Railroad, that it existed, before, you know, that until him, he put all these, you know, safe houses together and all that, mm -hmm. and obviously your talk wasn't really about that, but in, in what do you mean by calling him the father of the Underground Railroad, and, and could you talk, you know, for those of us who wanted a history of how it came together mm -hmm. and how people actually, you know, heard about it in the Deep South and got from there to Philadelphia with all those days of hiding. Could you talk a little bit about that too, sure. even if it's not exactly about still? No, no, I can definitely talk about this. So um, I think, I'm not supposed to give this away, but I think I came up with the, the name of the book before I really had a good justification for calling him Father of the Underground Railroad. And in fact, when I sent the manuscript off to a, a, a guy, Richard Blackett, who's this great, you know, sort of probably the, the great historian of fugitive slaves. The first thing, before he even read it, he wrote back to me, you gotta change the title. You know, he was like, I'm not buying this, he's not the father of the Underground Railroad. But I like the title so much that I thought about it, and, and I'm gonna make the case that he is. If we don't think of fathers as simply people who create things, if we think about fathers as primarily creators, then he's not the father at all. It predated William Still. People were even talking about the Underground Railroad with that language before he gets involved in it. But if we think of fathers in a broader sense, right, as nurturers, as people who cultivate and teach and do all the other wonderful, I'm speaking as a father here, right, so I dedicated this book to my son. You know, this, this fatherhood, this idea of fatherhood is very much on my mind. Um, I think he is the father. So I, I think, I talk about this, I think, in the introduction, that when I call him the father of the Underground Railroad, it's in that sense. He is by no means the creator. Um, but to your second question about, you know, what, what is this thing? How does it come into existence? I would say that people were running away from slavery as long as there was slavery, and they were often finding people who would help them. So people are helping fugitive slaves before they are doing so in a kind of systematic, collective way. And so for most of its history, the helping of fugitive slaves was done on a, a need basis, on an improvisational basis. What I think is important about William Still is that he's trying to take this kind of sprawling, improvisational aid to fugitive slaves and organize it in a way that is going to be systematic and, and more effective, right? In a way that will help as many people as possible. So I, I think that's... That's the kind of con the big contribution I think that Still is making here. Is that what you mean by pulling the father? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I also oh, just we think have it's two cool, over here. Cool title, <laughs> <on> right? <laughs> Sometimes yeah. you have to go with the great title, I think. So William Still escaped. You started your story by explaining that he escaped slavery. Correction. So he was never enslaved. So his parents. So his, yeah, his father had purchased his freedom. His mother was a fugitive from slavery. That's when she had to leave her two sons behind, and they settled in South Jersey. They had a huge family, 18 children, still was the youngest of them. Um, he was born free, never enslaved. So I have two questions for you. Um, the first one is, I'm wondering, in, as such a visible face of abolition, did he, was his life threatened? Did he have assassination attempts? Were there death threats, that sort of thing? And my second question is, William Still is going to live into the 20th century. So how does he spend the 1870s and 1880s and 1890s? Okay. Um, so interestingly, for all his prominence, there really aren't death threats, right? He's, um, the one time he's actually imprisoned, it's not over his Underground Railroad work. It's actually a libel case where a woman finds a letter that he had written in which she says that she, you know, he, he sort of said untrue things about her, and he goes to, to jail for three days, I think. Um, so I think 
one of the reasons for that is that things had changed very much in Philadelphia by the 1850s. So if you know anything about black history in Philadelphia, and, and again, we're, we're talking about local black history, uh, the 30s and the 40s were dangerous times to be black in Philadelphia, right? The buildings were burned down, Pennsylvania Hall, um, churches were burned down, people were assaulted, there were anti-abolitionist mobs. I don't want to say that Philadelphia had become a safe place for abolitionists by the 1850s, but I do think that in the 1850s, especially among the black community of Philadelphia, there's a kind of assertiveness, there's a willingness to protect themselves physically if needed, that changed the story a little bit. So that by the 1850s, we see when there's a, a fugitive slave case going on, again, just across the street at, at Independence Hall, which is where the court where they heard these cases was, there was a mob or a crowd of black observers outside standing there threatening, I mean, white people thought, saw it as threatening, but there in order to act if the case didn't go their way. That's not something you would have seen 10 years earlier. So I think that changing climate is part of what explains why Still was a little safer doing what he did in the 1850s and a little bit more comfortable doing so publicly. In regard to your second question about what he did for the rest of his life, um, so he always continued his activism, but he was a businessman as well. And I think as the decades went on, he was devoting more and more of his time to this growing coal business coal, coal, that yeah. made him a, a pretty wealthy man. Um, but to the very end of his life, he's involved in activism, philanthropy. Um, it's just a question of like, what's the balance between those two things? Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for writing the book. It's an important and very well written book, which I really appreciate it. I know a little bit about George Corson uh, from Plymouth Meeting because I was involved in saving Abolition Hall from the Hovnanian okay. developers a couple of years ago. Thank you. And I know that William Still knew George Corson not only because the 1872 book has a eulogy of George Corson by Mr. Still, but also because Jane Johnson apparently stayed with George Corson the night after she testified at the trial and left and was spirited away to leave Philadelphia and head north. Um, so I'm just wondering if you, since it appears to be such an important relationship in Still's life with George Corson, could you share with us any more information about that relationship? So unfortunately, I don't have a ton more information than we've already given us. I would just say that um, Still has a vast network. So Still has I mean, I, I, I sort of just gave us a little selection of the, the few people I mentioned that were his connections. But he has, I mean, his, his uh, tentacles are spread out all over this region. They extend certainly into the counties that, that border on Philadelphia. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a, a large number of people that he's involved with. All of those... I mean, Many of those evolved into personal relationships, right? So he has this ongoing professional relationship with many of these people. Um, clearly, by the 1870s, those professional relationships have become personal, and he's close friends with, with lots of these people. So you know, I don't have anything particular to add to that story, but, but yeah, he's a, a part of this larger cast of characters who are a part of this effort at which... So this, still I think, will be our last question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I noticed in the title sheet of the uh, uh, Underground, it was, it was, what is the title of the book? A History of the Underground Railroad? It's um, Vigilance, The uh, Life of William Still, Father of the Underground Railroad. No, I'm talking about the, the title sheet that you oh, showed. Oh, the, um, yeah, yeah, the, uh, of his, yeah, it changed yep. with each, each edition. It was always okay. changing. Okay, well, I noticed also it says sold by a subscription. That's, that's one item. But also, uh, William Still, Publisher. Number 244 South 12th Street, Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. That was his private residence? Yes. Okay. In that particular case, there's a, a historical plaque. Yes. And if anybody who's interested would like to pass by there, it's a 12, 12 between, uh, well, 12th and Locust area. Mm -hmm. So I just thought I'd bring that out. But it was, it's an interesting little thing. I, I passed him so many times that I had no uh -huh. idea what the guy was So about, unfortunately, right? that, the house that's there that's, that's marked is not the original house. Um, at some point, that was destroyed, and there's a new house built there. Um, it looks, I mean, you, you wouldn't know, but, but it's not the original house. But but in to your other point about how he published this, how he distributed it, I think all of that 
points us back to the point I was making earlier about how still understood the importance of making sure this history was done right. Um, and he didn't leave the distribution of this book to other people. He was not confident that they would sell this book. And so he recruited an army of agents who traveled around the country, often to former abolitionist hotbeds, to sell his book. Um, many of them were young African-American men and women. He liked them to be college educated, so he was recruiting this kind of newly uh, college educated class of African-Americans to go out and sell his book um, so it, it shows a kind of hands-on nature of Still, and that, that he really felt that it was incumbent on him to make sure that this story got out. So thank you all for being here, and thank <laughs> Professor Deemer for this fabulous talk and his wonderful book, which is available uh, behind us here. Uh, and uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. <laughs>